Okay, so you guys want to jump to fiber or anti-nutrients first? Uh, I would rather do anti-nutrients. Uh, fiber okay. could be, frankly, a, a, an entire discussion. And I think anti-nutrients are more central to the argument of Paul for why we should not uh, have a significant portion of our diet come from plants. Um, so I think that that would be more important to, to touch on. And I'll really let, let Paul start. There's quite a few, there's like several anti-nutrients. So I would like if Paul were to, uh, pick one basically as an example, and then we can start with that one and maybe move on to a couple more depending on time constraints. Just so we're clear, we're talking about things for, for the listeners like lectins, oxalates, phytates, um, Goitrogens, phytoestrogens, tannins. So, Paul, feel free to. I, I know you touched on this a bit earlier as far as inhibiting like zinc absorption, but feel free to give your, your overall take on these kinds of anti nutrients. Yeah, so it is interesting to think about these. These are just, there's a variety. Some of mm. them are polyphenolic, some of them are, are not. Isothiocyanates, for instance, are a different family of molecules than polyphenolic molecules. But when you look at them, there is a question, and as Alex said in the beginning, the, the question is, is the consideration of these over uh, overemphasized or do they actually present a problem for human health? And um, from my perspective, there there is a significant amount of literature to suggest mechanistically how they could be harmful to humans. Like I said, there are a number of case reports. Um, I don't know if maybe we'll start, maybe we'll do isothiocyanates. Let's just do that one as an example. Uh, mention at least this paper to start, which is just a consideration of polyphenolic compounds in general. Again, isothiocyanates are not polyphenolic, but it's a chapter uh, from a book about the inhibition of digestive enzymes by polyphenolic compounds. Specifically, what they're talking about here are tannins in plants. And this isn't really, I don't, I don't think people debate the, the veracity of this finding that, um, that at least in vitro and likely in EVO, consuming high tannin diets um, leads to lower amounts of protein absorption. So they say the evidence for this is summarized and discussed in relation to the possible effect of enzyme inhibition on reduced nutritional value. And it's concluded that uh, observed reduction in protein availability found in vivo on consuming high tannin diets cannot simply be explained by the formation of dietary protein tannin complexes that the ability of polyphenolic compounds to inhibit digestive enzymes may be of greater significance than realized previously. This is just, again, it's a, it's a chapter um, with a number of references, but there is uh, evidence that polyphenolic compounds, specifically tannins, do inhibit protein digestion, um, proteinases uh, throughout the body. And many animals that are primarily herbivorous, like a moose, uh, meese, meeses, obviously it's a joke, uh, chew things, uh, contain compounds in their saliva that inhibit these tannins. Rabbits are known to sort of chew their food frequently and allow the tannins to aromatize or uh, to become uh, sort of- uh, The aerosolized. To become, the aerosolized, yeah, thank you, um, from their mouths while they're eating them. So there are adaptations in herbivorous animals to these compounds and um, the, the assertion that I would make is that humans are probably not that adapted to consuming large amounts of these because of our history as primarily leaders evolutionarily and um, that they can be harmful to humans. Now, um, there are also examples in the literature of agriculture of um, animals being encased in small grazing areas or uh, overfeeding on certain plants and having very negative side effects or die-offs um, when their grazing lands are controlled. I've heard the author of the paper dealing with phytochemicals in beef, Fred Provenza, discuss this as well, that um, when you look at the way that animals behave in their consumption of plants, they're eating a little bit of one, a little bit of another, and if they, they seem to understand that if they overconsume these plants, they will have negative consequences. Similarly, if you administer anti-nausea agents to cows, they will overconsume these foods, not having that sort of feedback from the negative compounds in plants. Now, that specifically is probably an example of tannins or other polyphenols, but it, it's getting to the broader point that the plants do contain, do contain defense chemicals and that even animals that are primarily herbivorous uh, need, to, uh, need to take that into account when they are consuming them. 
if we specifically are thinking about isothiocyanates, this is a lightning rod conversation for sure. Uh, the most uh, well-known isothiocyanate is sulforaphane, and I've discussed frequently uh, about this one, but there are many isothiocyanates that may have the potential to be negative in humans at the level of uh, iodine absorption in the thyroid, uh, among other possible detrimental mechanisms. So this is an article uh, looking at uh, concentrations of different isothiocyanates, specifically thiocyanate and goitrin in human plasma, um, and with an associated risk for hypothyroidism. Again, we talked about the extreme example of this in people with endemic goiter and huge necks in Africa. It's not a question of whether this occurs, it's just a question of uh, what is the uh, what is the sort of uh, severity of this and how effective are these compounds at blocking this? And interestingly, uh, sulforaphane wasn't the worst at this, but there were other isothiocyanates found in brassica vegetables in this study uh, at levels that would be commonly consumed that had the ability to um, considerably lessen radioiodine uptake at the level of the thyroid. So as they say here, uh, in contrast, progoitrin and uh, indolylic glucosinolates degrade to goitrin and thiocyanate respectively and may decrease thyroid hormone production. Radioiodine uptake to the thyroid is inhibited by 194 micromole of goitrin, but not 77 micromole of goitrin. Collards, Brussels sprouts, and some Russian kale contain, contain sufficient goitrin to potentially decrease iodine uptake to the thyroid. However, turnip tops, commercial broccoli, broccoli rob, and kale uh, belonging to uh, Oleracea contain less than 10 micromole of goitrin per 100 gram serving can be considered of minimal risk. So it's just an illustration of the fact that these compounds do exist and are pretty clearly negative uh, at the level of thyroid absorption, of uh, radioactive or at least iodine absorption for the thyroid. So that's just one example of isothiocyanates. Now the you know, people will argue on the other side that these compounds have benefit, and I don't know where we want to take this conversation, because of their effect in the liver on the NRF2 system, and my response to that has always been that um, I think that there's pretty good evidence, or at least a compelling argument to be made, that we don't need compounds like isothiocyanates, be it goitrin or sulforaphane, to obtain optimal antioxidant status when we have other things in our diet that may be activating the NRF2 system, that being exercise, fasting, um, even heterocyclic amines from the consumption of meat may do this. Uh, many things in our diet and lifestyle may trigger uh, the overall production of um, glutathione containing or, or manufacturing compounds, precursors, et cetera. So, um, that's my overarching perspective on those, and I'm happy to clarify, or I'll just allow no, Alex to I think, respond. I think that was very thorough. Thanks, Paul.